Hello, in this video, uh, we're going to talk about muscles that cross the shoulder joint. And when I talk about shoulder muscles, I'm really referring to muscles that cross and move at the glenohumeral joint. Um, so today I'm not covering uh, muscles uh, that move the scapula, because um, those are also shoulder muscles. So like the trapezius or uh, rhomboids, for example, those are also muscles that move the scapula, so technically move the shoulder. Uh, but today we're focusing just on muscles that move the glenohumeral joint. Uh, so starting with deltoid. Um, so deltoid has fibers that go in opposing directions. So we can break deltoid down into three sections. There's the anterior deltoid, uh, the middle deltoid, and the posterior deltoid. Um, and so whenever we're thinking about the actions that a muscle can perform, always look at the direction of the fibers. So always look at the direction the fibers are going and look at the origin and the insertion. Okay, so when the muscle contracts, the origin is going to get closer to the insertion or the insertion will get closer to the origin depending on the movement. Um, so always look at the origin and the insertion and that shows you the line of pull of those fibers or of that muscle. So with deltoid, the insertion is the deltoid tuberosity, just that one point right there in the middle of the humerus. And the origin is very broad. It's all the way from the lateral third of the clavicle all the way up to the acromion and then the spine of the scapula. So it's got a very broad um, origin that has fibers starting at that origin all along that V on the top of the shoulder. And then it's coming down and tapering into that one little point. So the anterior fibers in the front have totally opposite actions of the posterior fibers in the back. And then the middle fibers really just abduct because um, they're just right on top and they abduct like that. But the anterior and the posterior fibers have completely opposite actions, which is why we get a muscle that does so many competing actions. Uh, so the only way that one muscle has opposite actions is when we have fibers going in opposite directions. Okay, so like for example, biceps brachii does not both flex and extend the elbow. It doesn't have opposite actions because it doesn't have fibers that are going in opposite directions or attaching in different places. Okay, so deltoid does have opposing fibers. So all three sections contribute to abduction of the glenohumeral joint. So it contributes to that um, frontal plane movement, that abduction. Uh, the anterior fibers flex the shoulder and the posterior fibers extend the shoulder. And when I say shoulder, I mean glenohumeral joint to be specific. Uh, the anterior fibers medially rotate, the posterior fibers laterally rotate. And then the anterior fibers horizontally adduct and the posterior fibers horizontally abduct. So moving toward or away from the midline along the horizontal plane. Okay, coracobrachialis uh, is highlighted in this picture here. Uh, it's a little one. It's in the anterior part of the shoulder. Uh, so because it's in the anterior part, its primary action will be flexion, but also if we're abducted, it will contribute to adduction of the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so then we get onto the rotator cuff. We have four muscles that make up the rotator cuff. One is infraspinatus. Uh, so it's this muscle in the posterior. It's going from uh, the posterior part of the scapula across the glenohumeral joint to the humerus. Uh, so because of the direction, again, if we look at its origin and insertion, uh, because of the direction of the line of pull of the muscle, it will pull back and laterally rotate. If we're abducted, it can also adduct. If we're flexed, it will extend. Uh, and then also it'll horizontally abduct. So if we're flexed, it could horizontally abduct. Um, and then all of the rotator cuff muscles contribute to stabilizing the head of the humerus in the glenoid. 
Okay, teres minor is just inferior to infraspinatus. Um, so if you look at its origin and insertion, um, it has essentially the same line of pull, it has the same insertion. Um, all that's different between infraspinatus and teres minor is the origin, but the origins are right next door to each other. So because we're starting roughly from the same place, going to the same insertion, um, we have the same line of pull or line of action here. We have the same list of actions as we had for infraspinatus. Subscapularis is on the anterior side of the scapula. Okay, so in this picture, we're seeing through the scapula. This is a posterior view. You can tell because we can see all the spinous processes on the spine. So this is a posterior view, but because the uh, subscapularis originates on the subscapular fossa of the scapula, that's on the anterior side of the scapula, which is why in this picture it's kind of ghosty. Uh, so we're seeing through the scapula to the anterior surface where it originates. So it's going from the anterior surface of the scapula, and then it's going to the anterior side of the humerus, to the lesser tubercle of the humerus, which is on the anterior side. Okay, so to clarify, it's on the anterior side of the scapula, but the scapula is still sitting on the posterior side of the rib cage. Okay, so it's still coming from the posterior side of the shoulder, but from the anterior side of the scapula. And then it's coming underneath the arm to the anterior side of uh, the humerus. And so to come underneath to the anterior humerus, it means that it's gonna pull from that front direction and that's gonna cause medial rotation of the glenohumeral joint. And then of course they all contribute to stabilization. Okay, supraspinatus is originating at the supraspinous fossa and going over the top of the shoulder. Uh, it's deep to deltoid. Um, and so it, because it's coming straight up over the top and it's right underneath that middle deltoid, they have the same line of pull. So both are gonna contribute to abduction of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, the difference in the function between supraspinatus and that middle deltoid is really in um, its mechanical advantage. So they're gonna work differently depending on what degree of abduction we're in. So supraspinatus, because of its advantage, because of its line of pull and angle at the joint, it actually initiates that movement of abduction. So it's responsible really for like the first 10 degrees or so of abduction. After that first just initial 10 degrees of abduction, then deltoid takes over and really is the stronger mover through the rest of the action. Uh, so like if somebody tore supraspinatus or had some kind of injury to supraspinatus that was severe enough, they would not be able to initiate that first 10 degrees. Um, so like if you ask them to lift their arm like this, they would actually lean to the side so that the arm hung and got that 10% and then deltoid would engage and, and lift it the rest of the way. So that's actually a really simple um, assessment to do if you suspect that someone's injured their supraspinatus. You just ask them to lift up and they'll just swing the arm up to where deltoid can kick in. Okay, biceps brachii. Biceps means two heads, brachii. We're referring to this upper region of the arm here. Um, so it's got two heads. Both heads cross the glenohumeral joint. So both heads have action at the glenohumeral joint. And then they come together. So we, the belly comes together and then uh, we have, it, the both heads essentially cross the elbow also, but they come together as one tendon uh, that crosses the elbow. Um, so both heads have action at the shoulder and at the elbow. Um, and when I say elbow, I mean in flexion extensions, so that'd be the humeral ulnar and humeral radial joints, and then also in uh, supination. Okay, so its action is to flex the elbow, flexes humeral ulnar and humeral radial joints. It also supinates the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. And then it also flexes the glenohumeral joint because it's in front of the shoulder. Okay, so I wanna talk about supination for just one second here. Um, for any muscle 
to supinate or pronate the forearm or the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints, it has to have an attachment on the radius. Okay, so in pronation and supination, I'll see if I can show you in the camera here, I don't know if you can see, but in pronation and supination, the ulna is essentially staying still and the radius is rotating around the ulna. It's rotating back and forth across the ulna in pronation and supination. So any muscle that pronates or supinates has to have an attachment on the radius because it's the radius that's being pulled back and forth to rotate a, you know, around ulna. Okay, so biceps brachii inserts in the tuberosity of the radius and the aponeurosis of the biceps brachii. So it inserts on the tuberosity, and then there's also this extra aponeurosis, this sort of band of fascia that projects from that tendon. Sorry, I'll turn my sound off here. Uh, projects from that tendon and inserts into uh, the local fascia of the elbow. Okay, so it has to attach to the radius to be able to supinate. Okay. Triceps brachii, triceps as in three heads, brachii as in this upper region of the arm here. Um, it has three heads, only one head crosses the glenohumeral joint. The other two originate on the humerus, so they do not cross the glenohumeral. So only the long head of the triceps brachii has any action on the glenohumeral joint because it's the only one that crosses it. The other two only originate on the humerus. Um, so all three heads act on the elbow, only the long head acts on the glenohumeral joint. So because they're in the posterior part of the shoulder and the posterior elbow, uh, they extend, it extends the humeral, humeral ulnar and humeral radial joints, so the elbow, and it extends the glenohumeral joint. And then also, if you look at kind of that angle of the long head, that's the red belly that we see in the picture here, you can imagine that if we're abducted, it's positioned to assist in adduction, uh, pulling that humerus back down towards the body. Okay, so primarily it extends the elbow and the shoulder, but it also will assist in adduction of the glenohumeral joint. Um, let's see, yeah, that's is it there? Okay, latissimus dorsi. Very big muscle that most of its belly is covering the back and the uh, more inferior portion of the back. And then it wraps around, so it narrows down into a much skinnier muscle and comes underneath, around the side of the body, underneath to the front of the humerus. Okay, so it's going from the back under the arms to the front of the humerus, the front of the shoulder. Uh, so because it's coming from behind and wrapping around to the front, when it contracts, if you look at its line of pull and we think about the origin or the insertion getting closer to the origin as the muscle shortens, to shorten, it's gonna pull in the shoulders into medial rotation. Okay, so one of its actions is medial rotation or internal rotation. Um, also, if the shoulder is flexed, it will pull down into extension, or if the shoulder is abducted, it'll pull down into adduction. Um, so if you think about a lat pull down, uh, there are lots of different ways to do a lat pull down, like we can do them with elbows out and pulling down this direction. So in that case, we're doing adduction. Uh, but we also can do them pulling down in this direction, that's extension. So in both cases, we'll be targeting lats because lats contribute to both adduction and extension, not just contribute to, but are prime movers. Okay, Terry's major is nicknamed lats little helper because it has the exact same actions. Okay, so it's going to the same insertion the fibers are going in roughly the same direction. They have about the same line of pull. Um, it just has a different origin. It's much, much smaller. So teres major is what is highlighted in the picture here. Uh, it's very small, this little red muscle here. So lat's little helper, same actions as lat, same insertion as lat, just different origin. This one's coming from the scapula versus lat, which was covering most of the low back. Um, so 
if we look at it where it is in context with the other muscles here, you can see infraspinatus is much larger and more superior covering most of the uh, infraspinous fossa there. Teres minor is just inferior to infraspinatus and it's going to the posterior shoulder. And then teres major coming all the way from that um, inferior border and the inferior angle of the scapula and it's going underneath the humerus to the anterior side. Okay, so teres minor, one of our rotator cuff muscles, is going up to the posterior side. Teres major is going underneath to the anterior side. Okay, so that is the easy way to tell which one is which. Teres minor is more superior and going to the posterior humerus. Teres major is more inferior and it's going to the anterior humerus because it's going underneath the arm just like lat, and so it has those same actions. And then you can also see in this picture here, we see tricep on the back of the, in the posterior part of the humerus, and you see the long head, the only head that crosses the shoulder, is going in between teres major going to the anterior side and teres minor going to the posterior. So that's the long head of tricep that's kind of threading in between them uh, to go up to the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. Okay, pec major, pectoralis major. This is another muscle like deltoid where we have different fibers of the same muscle going in opposing directions. So we have different sections of muscle with fibers going in in different ways. Um, so that's why we have so many actions here. Again, actions that kind of compete or conflict with one another. That's because we have opposite fibers. Um, so the pec major adducts the glenohumeral joint. So we're out here. It will pull down on the glenohumeral joint. Uh, it will medially rotate the glenohumeral joint. It'll assist in elevating the thorax and forced inhalation. So we take a big deep breath and it'll help lift the thorax. Um, then it also flexes the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so the upper fibers flex the humeral joint. The lower fibers extend the humeral, glenohumeral joint. And then the whole muscle also horizontally adducts the glenohumeral joint. So we're out here, horizontal adduction which that is the movement that we're emphasizing in like a bench press or a push-up. Okay, so if you did a bench press with your elbows straight out to the sides like this and you push, that is horizontal adduction of the glenohumeral joint. The only difference between this action pushing forward and this action coming in with straight arms, the only difference is what my elbows are doing. You know, if, if I'm just doing pure horizontal adduction with no other movement, then that's, it's just my elbows were extended the whole time. Compared to if I'm doing like a bench press, my elbows are flexed here and my elbows are extending as I horizontally adduct the glenohumeral joints. And then, you know, we do an incline or a decline bench press. We're just more emphasizing the upper or lower fibers. Um, so it's essentially whichever ones are on top are the ones that we're focusing on. So if we do like an incline bench press, we're emphasizing more the upper fibers or the clavicular fibers, we also call them. And if we're on a decline bench press, then we're emphasizing the costal fibers, the ones that insert on the cartilage of the ribs or the lower fibers. And then more in the middle, we're kind of, we're more targeting the middle fibers or the sternal fibers, um, but also the upper and lower are going to assist. Okay, so that's all I have for our glenohumeral muscles for this video, um, and I'll cover all the rest of the muscles in our future videos. Okay, thank you for watching.